I wrote this book about ancient history and um, one of the things I discovered was that ancient history is not all that ancient, that it has a currency, it evokes all sorts of themes. Collingwood uh, once wrote that historians always see history in terms of their own epoch and their own time. Now that has a very nice ring to it, that's sort of almost an axiom of historiography that each age redefines the history according to its own needs. And it's kind of a good antidote to the simple objectivism of, uh, of, of somebody like Ranke, for instance, von Ranke, who was considered a great historian, uh, who said, history is facts. And where do you get these facts from? You get these facts from documents. And where do you get the documents from? You get the documents from the Prussian government. <laughs> and no wonder the Prussian government treated him so handsomely. <laughs> gave him a chair at the university. The Bavarian king, the Prussian king, they gave Ranka all sorts of money. He was a total reactionary, hostile to the German parliament, as weak, a, a, as, weak as it was, and voted, and voted an honorary member of the American Historical Association about the second or third year of its existence. They, they put Ranka in as one of the great lights of history. So there is that view, and there are these people who are totally, what's the term, embedded, embedded in some interest or another, and they insist they're writing totally objective history. What I discovered in my research of, of the late Republic of the Roman Empire, which is roughly, say, 100 to, to 40 BC, what I discovered is that it just wasn't true. They don't all see this differently at all. They all see it exactly the same way. Augustine, whenever he opens his mouth about ancient Rome, about the Gracchi, sounds exactly like Cicero and exactly like Cyril Robinson or Ronald Symes, to name modern day ones. They all say the same things about that troubled and incredible uh, struggled, struggling period of ancient Rome. He sounds exactly like Gibbon. And the same with all the ancients. Plutarch, Dio Cassius, Appian, Suetonius, Tacitus, they all, all sound extremely the same. Then you look at the second string Roman historians. I thought maybe, for some reason, I thought, well, the lesser known ones, the small guys, maybe they'll get a little closer to a different perspective. No, Valerius Maximus, Valerius Perdiculius, Asconius Pedonius, they all, they all have the same view about the reformers of the Roman Republic. They all pretty much have Cicero's view, despite their differences in time. What really gets mind-blowing is when you read the modern historians. Almost all of them say the exact same things that the ancients did. So, despite the differences in language, despite the differences in epoch and culture and region and nationality, despite all those immense differences, they all sound exactly the same and take the exact same line because they all share the exact same class ideology. They all are gentlemen historians. Let me tell you what the issue is, what the problem is. What is the issue? This book, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, is a why done it. It's not a who done it. We know who did it. I make that point because I, I was in London, I, giving a, I was at a conference talking about this book, and the first program they printed out uh, said, um, who killed Julius Caesar? And I had to wire them and say, I mean, email them and say, could you please not say who we know? I'm, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe we could, you know, say, oh, it wasn't Brutus and Cassius, it was a lone assassin on the grassy knoll <laughs> with a bow and arrow 
by the name of Lee Harvis Oswaldus. I said, no, you know, we can't go that way. It's, we know who killed him. It's, it's why was he killed. That's the issue. Well, by the way, you know, book readings sometimes, I've been to some, the author, authors like to get up there and they take it quite literally and they read and they read and they read mercilessly sometimes, right? The, the fiction authors are, I think, among the worst. You know, say, I'll just read one chapter. You know how long a chapter can be? Mm. <clears throat> well, having said that, I, um, I will read a few lines only. The question that informs this book is why did a coterie of Roman senators assassinate their fellow aristocrat and celebrated ruler, Julius Caesar. The prevailing opinion among historians, ancient and modern alike, is that the senatorial assassins were intent upon restoring republican liberties by doing away with a despotic usurper. That is the position taken by almost all these historians, ancient and modern alike. That is also the position of the assassins themselves. I present an alternative explanation. The Senate aristocrats killed Caesar because they perceived him to be a popular leader who threatened their privileged interests. By this view, the deed was more an act of treason than tyrannicide. One incident in a line of political murders dating back across the better part of a century. A dramatic manifestation of a long-standing struggle between opulent conservatives and popularly supported reformers. Um, <clears throat> the Roman aristocracy remained forever inhospitable to Rome's democratic element. And Rome's democratic element was the people. That's another issue I'm going to deal with tonight, the way the Roman people have been portrayed again and again as the mob. I'll bet you there are a lot of people here who will say, I don't know a thing about ancient Rome. I don't know a thing about the late Republic. And I was one of those. I, I write in my introduction, I, like any good American intellectual, I got to the postdoctoral level without knowing three intelligent things about ancient Rome. But it's not true you don't know anything. When you say, I don't know anything, think about it. You do. You do. This culture leaves very little empty spaces. They fill it in with their garbage as quickly. We all knew something about ancient Rome, didn't we? We know they all had togas. We know they all talked like Laurence Olivier or Sir John Gielgud. We know they all went to the arena and did this and ha ha ha. And we know the Roman mob was just a mob wanting bread in circuses and screaming crazy and, and idiotically. So we do know. These are the things you fight against. Um, so one of, the, one of the great pleasures of history is not learning history, it's unlearning it. It's to unlearn what you thought you know. And you say, oh, you know, you get that, it's a very interesting feeling. Oh, wait a minute, that isn't what they have been feeding me. Well, isn't that interesting? And that makes it kind of even more interesting in a way. So Caesar wasn't killed because he was ambitious, as many historians say. They, ambition, I mean, ambition was their common coin. These aristocrats knew ambition. They'd kill their own mothers to get, to get a step ahead. Uh, they, didn't, they, they wouldn't be turned off. Oh, he's kind of pushy. Oh, he's kind of ambitious. <laughs> he wasn't killed because he, he grabbed power and he took power. Power was, again, the coin of the realm, the currency. That's what they were all dealing in was power. That didn't bother them. He, they wouldn't, they, as Suetonius says, they hated him and they killed him because he, he failed to rise when a delegation of senators came to give him certain honors. Oh, give me a break. You killed the leader of the republic because he didn't get up from the chair? They were all caustic with each other. They all cut each other and gave jabs and, and sparred in the Senate. Very acerbic debates at times. Yeah, like in Oakland. <laughs> he was killed because he used that power against their interests. He was killed because he began to infringe on the prerogatives of the aristocracy. He was killed because he, he, 
he canceled rent payments for an entire year. Do you know how you know how much a landlord likes you when you cancel rent payments for an entire year? That doesn't win popular. And most of these aristocrats were landlords. They were slumlords. Cicero was a slumlord. Crassus was the richest man in Rome. Most of his money, well, he had estates, he had merchant uh, trade and all that stuff, but most of his money came from uh, buying up mo many of the slums. They hated him because he, he instituted debt cancellation. Suetonius reckons about 25% of the outstanding debt in all of Rome was canceled by Julius Caesar. 25%, one-fourth, that's a lot. You know how creditors feel when you cancel debts on them? They don't like that either. And the, he canceled it because the rates, the interest rates in, in, uh, among the creditor class in Rome, and the creditor class were the same as the rich equestrians, and the rich equestrians were very close, and the same as the, as the aristocrats in the Senate. The aristocrats in the Senate had all the same investment interests as the other investor classes did. Housing, sl slumlords, land, trade, a few things like that. Interest rates were about 45% interest is what you paid on a loan. He also did, like the Gracchi before him, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus, who were both murdered by the aristocrats, Clodius, Clodius was in a very interesting, came from a leading patrician family, the Claudius family. I, Claudius, you know, ancient patrician family, changed the spelling of his name to Clodius with an O to make it more in line with working class pronunciation, interesting. Renounced his patrician status to become a plebeian, got himself adopted by some rich plebeian friend of his so that he could qualify and run as a people's tribune. But you, if you had patrician lineage, you could not be a people's tribune. You could still be a consul and all those other things, of course, like Caesar was. And organized, Clodius organized guilds and unions with proletariat, with um, slaves even. By the way, there were some, there were some Roman leaders who talked about freeing the slaves and having only free labor. There were a few, and there were a few who were moving that direction. Um, and that was an issue that was just beginning to come up in the Roman Empire. It, it was killed when Christianity came in because the Christians totally dampened that issue. No, no, no question. Absolutely, totally. Christianity was totally unsympathetic towards slavery. That's a myth about they, they were with the slaves and all that. They actually didn't like slaves joining the church and all that. Um, you can read about that in History as Mystery, my other book. Um, so... There was a the long line of these popular reformers, all of them from aristocratic background, who were murdered because they supported these kind of reforms that Caesar himself was supporting. Another thing he supported was land redistribution. The Gracchi were the first to start open that issue again. For centuries, Rome had been vittled by the farmers, independent, small, poor farmers working the rich lands of the Campania region around Rome, uh, many of them in cooperatives too. So here they was, they fed, here they fed Rome. Here were these markets, here was this consumption, these human needs were being answered, money was being made, the, and, and the land was publicly owned, it was the Egar Publicus, it was public land. Um, and the, and the farmers paid a modest rent to the public treasury. So you had revenue coming in, you had uh, markets, you had human needs being taken care of, you had human consumption, you had production, and you had these aristocrats not making a penny on the whole thing. I mean, it just infuriated them that the people just taking care of themselves, you see, without us controlling it and extracting as much as we can. Well, in those two centuries of the Punic Wars, right up until early in the second century BC, say maybe about six years before Gracchi, all that land was sooner or later expropriated from the poor farmers. They were driven off. Many of them had to serve in the infantry. In fact, the independent farmer was the great Roman infantry. And Rome's, Rome's power as an army was its infantry, not, not its archers or its cavalry, which were rather inferior. Um, 
Well, you know, you go away and you fight for 10 years, your farm can't be kept up. The rich aristocrats moved in there like, like the leeches that they are and took over, bought up these farms for pittance, and the ones who didn't want to sell, they brought their thugs in there and their strong-arm boys and beat them and drove them off the land, just as the rich corporations did in Appalachia against the farmers who were sitting on coal, or, or just as the, as the rich railroad magnates did against farmers all across the great expanse uh, who were in the way of their railroads and so forth. Drive them off with guns and clubs, kill them, and then you take the land. And that sort of thing happened. Well, what the Gronke started was this struggle to redistribute, to give some of that land back. Now it became large latifundia, was the, is the Latin word, which comes down to us through Spanish, latifundia, literally the large plantations, and they were being worked exclusively by slave labor. What happened to the farm is they were driven into the towns. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Into the shanty towns. In, in, in Rome, it wasn't shanty towns. It was tenement houses, seven, eight, nine stories high. Um, Walk-ups, of course. No running water. Uh, no, no lighting. No, no, um, no sewage. Uh, typhoid. Fires. The houses easily collapsed in many instances. So the, 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 there was the move among the reformers was to redistribute some of that land. Caesar also did some other things. He argued that every rich landowner who had a slave labor force had to hire one-third of his force as free labor. This would create more jobs for the proletariat. That's what they would call the proletariat. That was their name. Marx got the name proletariat from, from ancient Rome. And it would also cut in on the profits of the very rich and give some of it back to the people. Another thing he did was impose luxury taxes and limits on how much wealth can be accumulated. The limits were very generous. So that's why they hated Julius Caesar. The same reason they hated the Gracchi and Clodius and Saturninius and a whole range of uh, maybe six, seven other popular leaders from 133 BC to 44 BC. 133 is when Tiberius Gracchus was murdered. 44, Caesar was the last in a line of popular reform leaders. The evidence is overwhelming that this was what motivated them. <clears throat> now there's another axiom in historiography. It says, you must avoid the sin of presentism. It's a kind of contradiction of what Collingwood said about everybody sees history in terms of their own epic. This says just the opposite. You must not see history in terms of your epic. You must immerse yourself into the reality of the particular historical society you're studying. Immerse yourself into it and you must see it as its own people saw it. Now that's beautiful. Who's going to say, no, no, I want to do it the other way? No, he's going to say, that's beautiful. Let's assume it could even be done. But what does it mean? What does it mean to avoid presentism? I'll tell you what it means when you see a society purely on its own terms. It means you see a slaveholding society on the terms of the slaveholders. Who do you think wrote those books and documents and parchments and letters that you have and that you're looking at? What does it mean to say, see a society only on its own terms, immerse yourself into its, its struggles, its feelings, its sentiments, its values and all that? Good. What does that mean if you're doing research, let's say, on Nazi Germany? What do you do? Say, oh, wow, these Nazis are really, oh, I just feel like a Nazi today. And, uh, oh, look, they're cleansing Europe. Isn't that, that's what they're doing. I mustn't pass any judgments on that now. I mustn't take a critical perspective. And are they hurting anybody here? Oh, I'm just injecting my own values if I raise that question. No, that's an empirical question. Your own values may lead you to that question, and that's very good. That's why you want to have historians who have democratic values. It leads them to certain kinds of questions that Mumson and Gibbon and Augustine and Cicero never even think of asking. In fact, to look at a society only in its own terms means you're looking 
nine times out of ten, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, means you're looking at a society only in terms of its ruling class. That's what you're looking at. You are sharing the myths and rationales and lies and self-justifications that that class has about itself. And that is not the job of the historian. That's the job of a class propagandist, a ruling class propagandist. Arthur Kahn made this point. Contemporary American and British ancient historians are divided between Ciceronians, who are 95% of them, and Caesarians, a mere handful. And this is the interesting part. He says, and the division reflects their current political attitudes. That's Arthur Kahn, who himself is one of the handful of, of Caesarians. Well, Parenti, if all ancients and almost all modern historians have one interpretation about the motives of these aristocrats, how do you arrive at your conclusion? Did you unearth new evidence? No, I didn't unearth new evidence. I mean, 2,000 years, it's all been pretty much uh, developed, but you can take old evidence and make new associations with it. You can read your enemies and read against the grain. Many of you are politically aware, are politically active people. You get a good deal of your information from the mainstream media, from, from our enemies often. You can get it from the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle or... I mean, you have to go to page 23, paragraph 18, and you find something there, and you realize the significance. You, you see how they decontextualize it, and you recontextualize it, and put it in a context, and suddenly see its links and its meaning. And that's what you do here. I'll give you an example. For instance, Suetonius's discovery that Caligula contemplated building an annex to the library in Alexandria. Well, that jumped out off the page at me. Because there's this long-standing debate, as to, not really a debate, a one-sided presumption that Julius Caesar burned the great world-famous library in Alexandria when he was down there. Caesar loved libraries. He built public libraries in Rome. They were all shut down by the Christians when they came into power under Constantine. And all the books were burned then. The library in Alexandria was burned by a Christian mob. Uh, the books were, the, the, the building was, was, was left. When the Muslims came in, they were often also faulted. They did destroy what was left, but what they destroyed was a library that simply had a few patristic uh, and papal studies, uh, church, a few church writings, and, and, and Aristotle. So this is very interesting. I have a whole thing in the book there, I mean, a, a whole thing, a page and a half or so, showing how Caesar could not have burned the library. There's testimony of the library being in use years after Caesar. So here was this nice little datum from Suetonius. Now, I'm sure many people have read it, but I've never seen it used, and I was able to cite it and make that point. So that's how you could use old information in new ways. Uh, I'll give you another example. I found a letter by Cicero, and when I say I, f I found a letter, I don't mean I unearthed this letter, you know, and I blew it off and found an original manuscript. Uh, it's a letter. All, all his letters are published. But I'll tell you, if many historians had read this letter, uh, many also had ignored it. This is what the letter says. It was written right after Caesar was murdered. Mark Antony convinced the Senate that they had better keep Caesar's reforms. If you go to the Foro Romano today in Rome, you could see the Senate house is right, it's just about 100 meters up from the center of the Forum where Caesar's body was, where there was a huge crowd, including some of his troops. And Mark Antony convinced them and said, you better, keep, you better keep his reforms intact. And a very nervous Senate said, yes, we won't act against the assassins. That's their concession to them. They're going to be even-handed. And we're going to keep Caesar's reforms. Well, when Cicero heard about this, he was absolutely furious. After killing Caesar, his reforms rain, remain in place. Quote, Is it not lamentable that we should be upholding the very things that made us hate Caesar? He makes my case. That's my case. It wasn't Caesar's power. It wasn't Caesar's personal attributes. It wasn't this or that or the other thing. Caesar was now dead. That isn't what they hated. 
It wasn't that he violated the Roman Constitution and the Republic, as they were constantly saying. It was that he made these reforms. And that kind of evidence, you see, is systematically ignored by the Ciceronian. It's a very funny thing in history, because what you're dealing with here are intentions and motives. And no one's ever seen a motive. Motives are not empirically observable. We only can impute or ascribe a motive. We can never really uh, see one. You see the actions, and then the people who, who did take the actions give you a profession of what their motive was. And you can accept that or not accept it. You know, I attacked Iraq because it had weapons of mass destruction. That's what motivated me, you see. But you can, you can test it in certain ways. I mean, you can't test it as you could in a laboratory where you say there's an independent variable, a dependent variable, and you hold this constant, you control for that, and, oh, that didn't work, or oh, let's, let's, let's run it through again, this time we'll do another variable. Let's, you can't do that in history, it's true. You can't say, hey, let's all do the French Revolution over just one more time, but this time, would you please... <laughs> that doesn't happen. But you can weigh evidence against other evidence, you see. Consider this. The Roman senators, the assassins, killed Caesar because he was becoming a dictator and they wanted to preserve the Republic. That's the central view. Okay, how could you test something like that? Here's how you could test it. Very simply, about 40 years before, Rome did get a dictatorship. Sulla came in. Sulla brought an army into Rome, something that was a sacred rule, no general should ever lead his troops into Rome. Sulla came in and he murdered thousands of people. He murdered 50 senators who he felt weren't conservative enough. He murdered a thousand equestrians. He murdered thousands upon thousands of Democrats and common people. Sulla confiscated land. He wiped out the democratic power of the People's Tribune. He wiped out their power to veto certain senatorial acts. He froze out the popular assemblies. He bypassed them. He gave the Senate pretty much more power than it had in the Constitution in three centuries earlier. So what, what does Cicero say about Sulla's bloody dictatorship in 63 BC, looking back on what happened in 80, which was only 17 years before, and Cicero lived through it. This is what he says about Sulla's bloody reign. Quote, All was basically admirable, though temper and moderation were somewhat lacking. So, a big hug and then a little small slap on the wrist. So the senatorial aristocrats say they didn't want one-man rule, but they did want one-man rule when it went their way, when it favored their class interests. Look, they even then supported, for the next hundreds and hundreds of years, emperors who came in. After Caesar and after the Second Civil War, it was Augustus who took over. They supported him. They never, they never went back. They never advocated going back to a republican system. When push came to shove, their vast wealth meant more to them than state power. As long as state power was in the hands of someone who protected their vast wealth. That's the important thing to remember. Now what's impressive is how many classicists of the modern era share the ancient ad hominem characterizations of Rome's reformist leaders. One of the things the, old, the ancients all say, and the modern guys accept it and, and repeat it and add adjectives of their own, the Gracchi were rash, erratic, power-hungry, demagogic, violating the Constitution, unlawful, Clodius was ruthless, unstable, unprincipled. So was Catiline, so was Saturninus, and of course, so was Caesar. This investing, this ascribing ad hominem uh, devaluing attributes to popular reform leaders is a technique that still goes on to this day. Salvador Allende, I remember, he was called erratic and 
uh, volatile and this and that. Noriega was like uh, worse than Hitler and so forth. Milosevic was worse than Hitler, um, crazed, driven by his wife and so forth. Hugo Chavez, mercurial, erratic, erratic um, <laughs> dictatorial. I've yet to read a New York Times article about, about Chavez where they don't use the word mercurial, the mercurial uh, leader, you know, volatile. Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, the same thing. You know, not a word with Hugo Chavez, not a word about the clinics he set up for poor people in um, Venezuela. Poor people who for the first time in their lives are able to get medical attention. Not a word about that. Not a word about the tuition-free schools he set up for the people of Venezuela, for poor people who could never send their children to school because they couldn't afford the tuition before. Nothing about that. These ad hominem characterizations extend not only to the leaders, but to the people themselves. Throughout history, gentlemen historians have been writing about the mob, the rabble, the people who are irrational, the people who do all sorts of things, the denigration of the common people as a shiftless, ignorant mob, dangerously irrational. Gustave Le Bon. Gustave Le Bon wrote a book called The Crowd. He wrote it about 130 years ago, in the late, relatively peaceful time of the late 19th century. And yet he sounds almost like a French aristocrat about to get whacked on the guillotine. He was talking about the raging, irrational mob. It's called, the book is called The Crowd. It's been kept in print for 130 years. For 130 years it's been used and given to students, certainly in the U.S. And the ancient Roman writers <clears throat> were no different, nor the latter-day classicists. This is what Cicero says about the Roman mob, the rabble. That's what he calls them. Beggars, convicts, madmen, urban scum, slaves, foreigners, exiles, a starving, contemptible rabble. He admits they're starving, you see, but he, he doesn't see that as symptomatic of their victimization. He sees that as a deficiency that's personal to them. You see, the starving, unwashed. What do you say when people are unwashed, they're dirty? Why do you think people are dirty? Because they, don't, they can't afford to go to the baths the Roman baths, they, they don't have any running water. They don't have any olive oil to clean themselves with. They don't have anything. So that's why they're dirty. But no, you blame the symptoms of oppression on the oppressed themselves. Well, who were these people? If you read these historians, you find they were layabouts, wastrels, you know, just irrational thrill seekers at the bread and the, just waiting to live off free bread and free circuses had nothing else to do. First of all, you couldn't live off the bread dole. The bread dole for the Roman proletariat made the difference between starvation and survival. But it wasn't enough. You can't just live on bread. You need money for fuel. You need money for rent. You need money for clothing. Uh, they worked. That's what the Roman proletariat did. I'll tell you who they really were. They were Masons, carpenters, shopkeepers, scribes, glaziers, butchers, blacksmiths, coppersmiths. The, I gleaned all these professions from the various descriptions of everyday Rome. Bakers, dyers, rope makers, weavers, fullers, tanners, metal workers, scrap dealers, teamsters, dockers, porters, and various day jobbers. They were the toiling proletariat of Rome. And what did they do? What did they do in their time on the stage of history? This is what they did. They fought for two centuries against kingships and overthrew a kingship. They fought and, had, and mobilized and organized secessions, refusing to go in the army, refusing to participate um, and work, and going off the great Aventine secession and such to, uh, to win the right to popular assemblies. They fought for secret ballot and got it. They made common cause with slaves, sometimes, not always. They supported land reform, debt cancellation, rent reduction. They supported popular leaders like the ones I've been talking about, the Gracchi and Caesar, and they bitterly fought and opposed Sulla. 
As I said, I found that ancient history is not so ancient. I'll read you my favorite quote by Schumpeter. Joseph Schumpeter was a, a conservative economist. He wrote this in 1919 about Rome. He talked about Rome's imperial policy. And I haven't said anything about Rome's imperial. Caesar was also an imperialist. There was other things about him. I do write about it in the book that are not so admirable. His conquest of Gaul, his plunder, and, and, and all that. Definitely. And this is what Schumpeter said. The Republic was also an empire, just as our Republic is also an empire. He said Rome, that policy uh, of Rome which pretends to aspire to peace but unerringly generates war. The policy of continual preparation for war. The policy of meddlesome interventionism. There was no corner of the known world where some interest was not alleged to be in danger or under actual attack. The fighting was always invested with an aura of legality. Rome was always being attacked by evil-minded neighbors, always fighting for a breathing space. The whole world was pervaded by a host of enemies and it was manifestly Rome's duty to guard against their aggressive designs. So there you have it. That expansionism is not really a pursuit of power for power's sake merely. It's not just we want to have power and we want to rule. It's because they wanted to do certain things with that power. It's because they gained certain things. War and expansion was very favorable to the aristocratic class. They fleeced their own people. They fleeced the peasantry of the Italian peninsula. And they fleeced and they robbed from the entire empire. Uh, Rome was, uh, the Roman Empire was for them a very, very profitable thing. It was part of their self-enrichment and that is something we should not forget. I was wondering if I could read uh, something. I read a little piece of the assassination. Would you like to hear that? This book has lots of sex and violence in it, by the way. I want you to know that. Uh, let's see. On the penultimate day of his life, during the course of conversation while dining with Lepidus, Lepidus was Caesar's captain of the cavalry and a few other intimates, Caesar posed an unsettling question. What is the best sort of death? After his companions ventured various opinions, he himself commented that a sudden unexpected end was the one he would prefer. That night, the story goes, his wife, Calpurnia, dreamed of seeing him lying in her lap with many wounds and streaming with blood. The next morning, much distraught, she implored Caesar not to stir from the house and to postpone the Senate session. His wife's remonstrance gave him pause since she ordinarily was a composed and level-headed individual not given to womanish superstitions, as Plutarch put it. That's in quote, womanish superstitions. Plutarch himself was richly freighted with superstitions, presumably male-gendered. He tells us that just before Caesar's death, fire issued from the hand of a soldier's servant, yet left him unburned, and he names a few other things. An animal sacrificed by Caesar was found to contain no heart, quote, a very bad omen because no creature can subsist without a heart, the great historian reminds us. Omens aside, the political climate was disquieting enough. And Caesar himself had misgivings, and I go in here and I talk about that, and then I quote from uh, Cicero's reassuring speech in the Senate and says, Caesar, how could you suspect that there are enemies here? We all love you. The way you have treated us so magnanimously, you won the Civil War and yet you gave us back all our land and you've been such a wonderful guy. We swear we will protect you ourselves with our own breasts and bodies. I mean, these cloying reassurances did not leave him completely reassured. Now on the fateful morning of 15 March, 15 March is the Ides of March, the Ides in the Roman calendar are the 15th, 13th, 14th of every month. It varies, one of those days. Uh, there was the Calends, that's the first of the month, and the Nones are usually the ninth or seventh of the month. They just had the naming of something, and they would calculate things backwards from, they say, the third day from the, from the Ides, which would mean March 12, 
and the second day would be March 13, so forth. I mean, I mean, it was a very cumbersome way of calculating the calendar. I discussed, I gave that a page. That was about all it was worth, but it was kind of interesting. <laughs> now, on the fateful morning of 15 March, uneasy about Calpurnia's dream, Caesar turned to Antony, who had just arrived, and instructed him to go postpone the Senate session. But Decimus Brutus, one of the few to have regular access to Caesar's residence, entered as Antony was about to leave. On hearing of Caesar's decision, Decimus strongly urged the reconsideration. The senators have been waiting in attendance for some time. Uh, Decimus Brutus, by the way, not to be confused with Marcus Brutus, one of the key conspirators, Decimus was, was rather close to Caesar. He had been his general in Gaul, too, but when the final time came, choosing between his personal loyalty to Caesar or his class interests, uh, he, he joined the aristocratic conspirators. Anyway, Decimus convinces him that the Senate, I'm going to paraphrase some stuff, they, they, they're going to be a rather miffed. If he doesn't show up, he called the session. And uh, is, he, is, is it like Caesar to hide behind a woman's fears? Or does he give in to superstitions like this? And, and why doesn't he at least come and tell them he's got to postpone and maybe you know, we can have this some other time? And then there's also stories that a, a Greek teacher of logic who had been a former tutor of Marcus Brutus and caught wind of the conspiracy had attempted to tip off Caesar. There, one, one version says he went to his house, but he had just missed him. Another was he got to him and gave him a warning paper, but Caesar never was able to read it because of the press of all the people around him and such. But anyway, Caesar makes his way into the hall. The conspirators stationed a backup complement of gladiators in the adjourning theater, which is an arena, really who could rush to their assistance should senators loyal to Caesar give them trouble. They were especially concerned about Mark Antony, a physically powerful man not easily routed. He would likely be situated close to Caesar. So they contrived to have Gaius Trebonius, Antony's acquaintance and one of the conspirators, detain him in conversation outside the hall. Upon Caesar's entrance, everyone rose to their feet. A group of senators quickly gathered about him in an apparently friendly manner. Caesar had scarcely occupied the ceremonial chair when one of them, Tilius Simber, petitioned that his brother be allowed to return from exile. Caesar waved him aside. This was not the time for such a matter. They could pursue it on some other occasion. Others moved close pretending to join in the request. Then suddenly Tilius laid hold of Caesar's robe, yanking it down from his shoulder, the signal for the assault. The first blow came from behind, delivered by a trembling Publius Casca. It missed its mark, grazing Caesar about the shoulder. He whirled about, seizing his assailant by the arm, wounding him with the stylus he used for writing. Caesar then bolted forward, only to be slashed in the face by Cassius desperately flaying at his attackers and issuing furious cries like a trapped beast, he took another blade into his side, then swift thrusts into his thigh, his back, and his groin, until he staggered and collapsed, some say, at the base of Pompey's statue. Even then, the assailants continued savaging him with their daggers, some of them accidentally cutting each other in the melee. Suddenly, all was quiet. Caesar lay motionless, bleeding to death from 23 stab wounds. At this point, Marcus Brutus turned to the Senate Assembly to reassure them that all was well. He would now set forth the reasons behind this act of tyrannicide. Certainly here was an apt venue for discoursing on the more unsavory imperatives of Republican restoration. But the senators were in no mood for a civics lesson. Frozen in astonishment, for the brief seconds of the onslaught, they began stampeding out of the hall, tripping over each other as they fled, some fearing they might be the next victims, others just wishing to distance themselves from the murder and all its frightful implications. Brutus and his confederates followed them out, triumphantly brandishing their blood-stained weapons. Being still hot from their exploit, they marched as a body, 
not like perpetrators who thought of taking flight, but with an air of lordly assurance, calling to the people to reclaim their liberty and inviting persons of rank to join them. They didn't invite people to join them, they'd invite persons of rank. Some of the latter did enter their procession, acting now as if they too were authors of the bloody design and could claim a portion of its honor. In the empty meeting hall, Caesar's body lay crumpled in lonely silence throughout much of the day. Eventually, three of his slaves ventured in and carted it away. Thus did Gaius Julius Caesar meet his sorry fate in his 56th year on the Ides of March, 44 BC. Forty years earlier, on that very day, a graceful, handsome 16-year-old youth strode amidst a joyous gathering of family and friends who prayed that the divinity might fashion a brilliant destiny for him. It was a festival celebrating the threshold of spring on the Italian peninsula when living things are touched by the sweet stirrings of nature reborn and people lift their hearts in the hope of better times to come. And so we too should hope for better times to come and not only just hope, but we should struggle and fight for those better times. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks.